too much hair, it's already getting messy. Okay, hi, um, my name is Sarah Drasner and we're here today to talk about storytelling in the age of JavaScript. Um, I am a storyteller on the web and you probably are too because um, if you make or design or work on products or work on engineering for something on the web, you're actually telling stories. So let's kind of dive into that. So why is storytelling important? During this talk, we're gonna explore storytelling on the web by going over why it's important, why we should care about it at all, why that's like even necessary. We'll go over some concrete examples to get you going, and we'll do, talk about some general options for the course of a story on the web. We have, I'm gonna show like little bits of code just so that you get the general idea of things, but this slide deck, which I'll tweet the link out um, of afterwards in the last slide, will have the URL for, has embedded in it all of the demos that are all working in OSS on CodePen so you can dig into the code on your own. Um, yeah. So, why is storytelling important? Storytelling is a fundamental piece of our humanity. Our earliest records of humans revolve around storytelling. Part of the reason for this is that our biology rewards us for being curious. We ask ourselves what's in that bush so that we can eat something or run away from a predator. We get a dopamine rush from hearing stories. So. Story also allows us to plan for the future. We can imagine possible scenarios and kind of go through things that might be dangerous to us or like things that we need to be thinking about without actually physically going through them so we can kind of prepare. Um, for these reasons, we crave story. If you had a hard day at work, sometimes you come home and you chill out and you watch Netflix or you go to a bar and you trade stories with your friends. It's actually you know, something that, that your biology rewards. So some of you might be familiar with journey maps on a website, but in case you aren't, here's an example. It's walking through the process of being a visitor on your site and all of the steps that they might go through and what it looks like to be them. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is framed within that type of journey. Now, that seems simple enough, so what are the things that are getting in our way of a seamless experience on the web? Well, each of these teams have different products and so like let's say you have like a big site and you have a you know a search page and a product page but people are not actually talking to each other about how you transition from the search page to the product page and back again and you know even within these teams we get split apart so the product person is like oh we got to get that them to click on that button like times a million times and you know design wants to make everything look co cohesive and branded and like you know, not like a crazy mess. <laughs> and uh, engineering is like, oh, we wanna like take out legacy code, we wanna use this new JavaScript framework. So even within those teams, we get a little bit divided. So um, in storytelling and in building websites, we have something called the so what factor. People start off intrigued, but user attention is so short. It drops off after two seconds. Um, and what we know about this is that Amazon's discovered that for every one second delay, conversions drop by 7%. Uh, Walmart loot find that it gains 1% revenue increase for every 100 milliseconds of improvement. And usually we talk about that in terms of performance. And that is very, very important. But I'd argue that it's actually equally important that we talk about this window of time in terms of sustained curiosity. Your site could be the fastest loading site in the world, but if it's not ultimately compelling, people will leave. The inverse is true too. Your site could be the best story ever told on the web, but if it takes too long to load, no one will ever see it. So these two things kind of work in tandem. And when a view, user visits their site, they're not worried about the button, if it works like a, looks like a dribble shot, if it's using the latest JS framework, they're wondering, is it useful, is it captivating, is it easy enough to use? And the issue that you might run into, even with the journey maps, is that a user in those journey maps is going from A to B. But I don't know about you, I'm not usually even aware that I'm going from A to B as a user. I'm not necessarily going to a site with you know, a target in mind. Sometimes I'm just curious, I just clicked on something, I have no re idea why I'm there. So this is actually your best case scenario. Okay, so now that we've made this sound sufficiently com complicated, let's break it down so it's not. 
Um, it's easier to plan our user's journey if everyone agrees on the end. And you might think that everyone on your team is agreeing on the end. You all like think, oh, okay, you end up at the contact form. But if you start these discussions, you might find out that you might not be aligned on these things. So if you spend your set, like a minute talking to your team and talking about what you're trying to get the user to do, it really helps you track validation, what a success, successful project looks like, and evaluate if whether the, or not those A-B tests that kind of like deteriorate things over time are actually in service of your site or hindering it just by little tiny nuts and bolts. So I talk about spatial maps a lot because I think that that's how our users are actually navigating our pages. When a user visits a site, they're scanning, their eye isn't staying in one place, it's scanning the environment to create a spatial map of the site that they're seeing. We usually see this in terms of like, People, websites start to look the same, the call to action ends up being in the same place, we have the same kind of hero again and again. That's mostly because we were kind of relying on the fact that they already know where things are. So this is an event called saccade, when our eye kind of looks around and moves around. Um, and if the entire team is aligned from beginning to end, you can start to connect those states in a way that reduces friction from, for the user and makes them not have to scan so much. So the other thing to understand is that your user doesn't look like this. Your user is never a smiling, happy person in a bright room. Your user looks like this. They just got in a fight with their boss, they're holding a screaming infant, they spilled coffee on their lap. Um, that's actually probably more likely. So it's our job to not expect that we need, that what we know about our sites is immediately like apparent to our users. We need to be immediately clear to them and we need to help shine a light in a sea of features on the thing that might be the most important part for them. And I particularly like this accessibility user study for Microsoft. If you're working at a company, you might make the case that not a lot of people only have one arm, so we don't really have to care about them. But if you start expanding to more situational injuries or changes, you can see your user base expand and it's, it makes it easy for people to kind of understand that it's, you have to make things as easy as possible for people to explore. So we need to think about how we can offer users clarity. We, have to, we can get them to click on that button or make it look beautiful or use the newest JavaScript framework if we're all aligned and making sure that we're all offering something that's clear together. And this doesn't begin or end with the user's experience either. When Adi Asmani asked what developers needed to create PWAs, the answer was better docs and guides. Developers and teams need clarity too. So uh, very, few, very few of us are just building sites like in the you know, heavens from scratch with like nothing. We're usually taking and consuming a site that already exists and trying to make it better. So um, I work as a consultant across a lot of different companies and teams and this exercise is one that I usually have people do. Um, I, I have them take all of the features on their site and write every single thing down that's on that page. And they're you know, each on a post-it note. And then I draw this on the board. Customer, things customers love, stuff that makes us money, stuff that makes us stand out against our competitors, and not applicable. And you know, people kind of put them in each category. Now, the whole purpose of this exercise is to find out what's there. And that's the stuff we eliminate. Because if it doesn't make you money, customers don't like it, and it doesn't make you stand out against your competitors, you might, like it might have been your pet project a couple years ago, but just get rid of it. Um, it's, it's crowding the user's view and it's making them have to scan more material. So if we're considering how a user feels on your site, we have to consider the site's personality. And you might be thinking, personality, like hold up, my site isn't a person, thank you very much, uh, but hold the phone. We're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly about site's personalities. So you remember Clippy? Of course you do. <laughs> um, Clippy is the end all be all of annoying UX examples and people usually think it's because Clippy kind of popped up out of nowhere. But think about it for a second if Clippy was a person. If when you started writing a letter, a person came along and said, hey, do you want some help writing that letter? The first time you'd be like, hey, no thanks, like that's cool, and they might be, it might be a little irritating, maybe not, that's not such a big deal. But he kept popping up and asking the same question over again, and he never learned. So if you consider that to be a person, if a person just kept coming by every time you're writing a letter and it's like, hey, what's going on? Do you need help? Hey, <laughs> then you know, that's an annoying person. 
Um, again, you might be thinking, but like a computer or a site is not a person. But research shows that we actually might be thinking of them subconsciously as one. So one company used to do a yearly survey of all of the software employees used. At first, they had, they had like a separate computer that they took this survey on and they were re you know, reporting that they didn't like things or whatever. And then one year they figured out how to have everybody take it on their own computer and all of a sudden the reports went way up and everybody was reporting that they liked the software even though the software didn't change. So people subconsciously will not tell their computer that they don't like their computer because they think it's rude. <laughs> And this is not something that like, if you went up to them and said, do you think that you're being rude to your computer, that most people would say, ah, no, of course not. But subconsciously, we kind of have that in our head. So if we go back to the Clippy model, we can understand that Clippy was annoying because his personality was annoying. So they ran tests where they actually had Clippy made, make fun of himself, and he even suggested that you write a letter to Microsoft telling them that they did such a bad job on him, and he's like, really let him have it. And people started loving Clippy. <laughs> um, so Clippy became a likable person. So here's one example of a site that I think is a great welcome journey. When you sign up for CodePen, they take you through all of the functionality and like, kind of teach you how to, how to use it. You set the pace, as the user and you decide when you want to go to the next step and you can type things in. You can also see from the progress bar that you, where you are in the tour. But I would argue actually that the most important part feature in this whole tour is the fact that you can leave at any time. That's kind of important. As a human who's having a conversation with someone, you don't want to get the sense that you're stuck in a conversation with someone. Um, so this is actually a really, really good way of doing onboarding. Um, I think Smashing Magazine's new footery design is a perfect example of good personality, and I'm not just saying that because Vitaly's in the audience. <laughs> the cat is the mascot for Smashing, and you can see him uh, here on desktop, pouncing towards the bird. But then when you scroll the window down, you get this funny story of what might have happened to the bird. This is actually really smart, because anytime we feel an emotion, our capacity to remember increases. Something attaches to our limbic system, and we re can recall that much better. So this is, a really, this is really smart branding and a really smart use of a website. I think Netflix is a good example of good and bad personality. Like, sometimes I'm really glad that it learns me and learns my behavior a bit, but sometimes it goes too far. Like, if I watch a bunch of horror films in a row, and then I watch a comedy, then I'm only all of a sudden ever showed Shaun of the Dead. Um, and you can see this one user here had a, you know, two accounts, Hattie and Drunk Hattie, to kind of you know, hack the system and circumvent the way that they did this. Um, so if you'd like a, and this is actually done with some machine learning algorithms, and there's actually a thing called TensorFlow for Poets. So if you want to check out you know, machine learning algorithms and how they work, but you don't have a like, strong machine learning coding background, you can totally do it right there, and it's really, really interesting. So personality is also important in storytelling because it kind of teaches you empathy. Wow. So this is Wally that I made with uh, SVG and you know a little cursor override, wow. and and he kind of blinks and tries to get his cockroach friend and stuff. But you know Wally is very very likable as a character when we watch that um, that show. So you immediately kind of connect to something that you can like, like feel empathy towards, and it's way, um, a way to get more attached to that experience. The humble loader is incredibly important when we consider perceived wait times on the web, and this has a lot to do with our curiosity. So um, humans overestimate passive wait time by 36%. Um, Eli Fitch gave a great talk about this called uh, perceived performance, the only kind that matters. And I think that's a great title because it, it really is true. You can run timeline benchmarks in JavaScript all, you know, all day, and I do do that, but what it's not telling you is how the user's actually perceiving that amount of time. Even if it's only two seconds, it might feel a lot longer. So um, Viget did a study with a couple of different loaders. One was like the kind of default loader and one was just you know, their brand with the loader. And they found that people were willing to wait twice as long just because they put their brand on it. 
And this is the Wave app loading experience. If you want to learn how to code something like this, there's a great P5JS coding train with Daniel Schiffman that's free on YouTube. So um, some things that we know that we can like help you know, make loaders really, really awesome. Uncertain wait times are longer than known finite waits. That's why that, those progress bars are really successful. Um, Disney World and airports both know that entertainment while you're waiting makes it not feel as long. So Disney World will show you like animatronic things going on. Airports actually make you walk all the way around to get your bags so you don't feel like you're waiting very long at baggage claim. They're kind of like hacking you. Um, anxiety makes waits seem longer. So if you give somebody your credit card information on the web and you don't know what happened and no feedback is given to you, it makes the wait feel a lot longer because you're like, oh, I just gave my credit card to the system. Um, and also people want to get started. That's why doctors bring you into waiting rooms before they're actually ready to see you because you feel like you're like already on the doctor journey. Um, for a little while, I didn't have this slide like on the slide deck because it's so captivating that I have a hard time looking at it and speaking at the same time. That's a really good case for a loader. If it's so captivating, you like lose your train of thought. That's perfect. Oh, there's a loader collection on CodePen that has just like tons and tons of loaders to explore. I think loaders are a great case for SVG. SVG can be super small if you uh, design for performance. It offers a navigable DOM so you can dive right into it and animate small parts without any crazy positioning. Um, I'm going to talk about the GreenSock animation API a little bit later on, which um, provides cross-browser stability on all devices and even IE. Um, so that's pretty awesome. SVG is fully supported, all green on Can I Use. You can go look it up. Um, and it's easily scalable for responsive. It's in the name, scalable vector graphics. That's a really big part of it. Another big part of it that you might not know is if you dive into the SVG DOM and you animate things, even when you're scaling it, you don't have to adjust those animation parameters. They exist within the coordinate system, so the animation scales too. So that's really good for responsive development. So this is an, um, an example from an extension I use called Honey. Um, what it does is it kind of like checks the internet for other coupons and codes that you can use to apply to your, you know, anytime you're checking out of a sale. Um, and sometimes that process takes about 30 seconds. So here you have the progress bar, you have a cute little animation that's kind of like, like taking your attention, and you can also see the testing codes working while they're you know, while she's going. So it's actually captivating. I can actually watch that animation for a full minute without feeling bored or closing the thing out. And that is really vital to the health of that extension. Um, I also made this uh, loader for Smashing Magazine uh, for their checkout experience. And this, the, the reason why I'm showing this to you is because the entire file size is six kilobytes, which is really, really nice for um, a really small loading experience. Chris Gannon also does really, really beautiful SVG animations. He found somebody playing around in After Effects on Dribble and recreated it in SVG. Um, if you are not familiar with his work, definitely go explore his code pens. Um, and if you want to, oh, sad little thing. Well, I'll give you the, I'll, I think this is the only one that actually uses the internet. So um, it, there's foreshadowing or hints are really, really important to showing the, um, the user exactly where they're going. So if you're trying to do like an innovative experience, showing the user exactly like how they can be interacting with something is really important. And I'll show you an example. I made this animating the view box and you can see there's this like and for the SVGs and you can see these little bloopy bits the little bloopy bits, that's the technical term, by the way. Um, <laughs> they allow the user to know where they can be clicking in that map. And this whole thing is one SVG that I'm just changing you know, what we're focused on by animating the view box back and forth. So I don't actually have to load other graphics. It's perfectly scalable for responsive. It's really, really good for data visualization. And here's another example um, of like showing a hint. This is kind of like a unique way of like playing with this app. So what they do is they kind of show you what it would be like to play with it before you get started. It takes two seconds just to kind of, you know, show you what you should be doing and then you have a good ramp up. So the element of surprise. I don't know 
know if you guys saw the BBC interview when the kids interrupted his dad. <laughs> um, timing is really important for things like surprise and also for these kind of storytelling. So if you see this little baby and his legs go and he's kind of funny, if I change the timing of the legs and he's going even just like 0.2 seconds slower, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> you know, he really needs to be like moving them in this like kind of, you know, chaotic way. And this is a little bit off topic, but I had the funniest and most amazing JavaScript error, error while I was working on this, where the baby just kept coming out before everything else. Like, you didn't wait for his time in the timeline. I was like debugging it, and every time I'm like, baby, no! <laughs> and he's like... <laughs> Um, okay, so considering how things look to your user, we especially see this overlap of surprise and timing when we consider timed interstitial modals. These, this is a really bad dark UX pattern, so when you visit Groupon for the first time, this modal comes up almost right away. I'm not even sure if I want to use it. I've never used this site before. Like, I'm not sure if I, I'll find this site like helpful at all, and it's already asking me for this information. So, but if you think I'm being picky about this or just like cranky about it, Google agrees. And this kind of timed interstitial will actually decrease your SEO now. There was also a post recently called Shame the Confirm Shamers um, that showed all the ways that people insult people if they won't, you know, give them their, their um, you know, email or whatever. And like, I think this one is the funniest one. It's like, 80 books, no, I don't read. Like, <laughs> not like I don't want these books, but like, I just don't read at all. Um, so if you think about your site as a story, it's like getting to the initial credits and then insulting people. <laughs> um, and this one is particularly bad partially because of that spatial awareness thing that I was mentioning before. When I go to the site, I have to continually readjust where I am in the page because the layout's constantly moving around as things are loading. And this is documentary footage of me trying to read an article on that site. <laughs> So now we've kind of looked at the things that we shouldn't think about when we're telling our story on the site and why it's even important to do so. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of some things available to you with actual code. Um, so I'm not saying that these are the only ways to do this. I'm just giving you some ideas for which to go forward. So we were just talking about the element of surprise. What's a good example of how we could do this with web tools? Well, in order for anything to be exciting, or surprising, or we have to set up initial world view or layout so that it be, can be changed. So that, that's actually just running in the browser. That's SVG. Um, and this is like surprise with a technique with SVG filters. So right now we like set up this world of like kind of polygon forms and you kind of get used to it for just a second. And then we split it apart with a distortion filter that doesn't look anything like the initial thing. So it has that kind of pleasant surprise. Um, but something worth mentioning is that SVG filters can be a little bit performance insensitive. So what I'll do right before I, you know, when I'm working with SVG filters is I will wait until exactly the moment I need them, apply them, and then remove them. So you can see um, with GreenSock, I can actually tween the attributes of, you know, usually you have to like, in, S in CSS, you have to like work with the spec and stuff. What's nice about GreenSock or RAF, Request Animation Frame, is it's literally just changing numbers. It's just dumb. It's like beautifully, beautifully dumb. Um, so it doesn't need things to be approved by the spec. So you can animate things like base frequency and get perfect support across all browsers and IE and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but you can see I'm calling on this timeline. I'm calling add attribute and remove attribute after. And that'll initially set the the filter to zero and then immediately remove the attribute as soon as I don't need it. These are just help, helper functions that I'm using. So another thing we talked about was creating a more seamless transition from beginning to end of the user journey. Identifying the end of the story and making sure that the transitions from one state to another happen as seamlessly as possible. This example by Leah Lung shows a really, really nice seamless transition and it really feels good. So our goal is to get the user from point A to point B um, and make that as seamless as possible in code. So one way of doing that and collaborating between design and engineering is to actually take a map of like what all of those different views are and find 
what's correlated between those things. Find the things that stay the same. So here's an example of not having a transition. It kind of becomes jarring for the user. They have to remap every time something shifts or changes. And it's a kind of a lost opportunity because it feels a little bit clunky. Um, so I'm going to talk about transitions with Vue. I'm going to talk about a bunch of um, examples with Vue.js. It's a JavaScript, JavaScript framework just like React or Angular. Um, I'm a big fan of it. They're really, really, really good at dealing with transitions. So what they do is encapsulate what's changing declaratively. We've got, you know, enter and v enter active, so we can plug into all of these things here. Um, and all of the pieces here are optional. You don't have to plug into every single one. They just give you these hooks so that you can work with CSS or JavaScript. They also allow you to have little pieces of sugar. Like one of the pieces of sugar that they have are in-out modes. And what in-out modes allow you to do is specify, should this one component wait until the other one is done? And that's actually like a pretty common use case. Like that's like something you will almost definitely need. Um, so being able to specify that and not having to kind of imperatively say, after this one, do this, is really super helpful. Now this is an example without in-out modes. It's not terrible, but you can see it kind of snaps and the other one already completed, so we never even got to see that animation. So in the HTML, it's actually pretty simple. We have a transition component. We have the mode that's like out and in, and we have a slot, and slots in view allows to slip, uh, switch out content really easily. Um, if you're familiar with Angular, you'll probably understand these v if, v else. They're just conditionals that you're allowed to use as directives directly in the HTML. So our transition here plugs into the interactive class hook, and we'd state how that transition would look. So we basically give it a name, and then we can say flip interactive and call that transition, and it'll transition between those states for us. So Jeff Graham wrote this great article on CSS tricks about feature requirements, and I think this is exactly what we need to build our transitions. As a user, I expect that so that, so you know, identify the user, describe the task, and explain the anticipated outcome. If you write these little bits out, or make really quick thumbnails that look, even if they look like garbage, just little notes to yourself before you get going can really, really help cut down on time during development. So I made this in view as well with SVG. So we're gonna... So once we've encapsulated what's changing, each component can actually own its own state. The entrance will always be consistent and the exit will always be consistent. And we can reuse these components, we can change their order, we can keep our code really dry, and we can manage their state in a really clean and simple manner. So in this example, I'm not even passing the state around. I create a centralized store in Vuex, which is kind of close to Redux if you ever use React. Um, and I can number these templates, toggle their visibility, and advance them every time that toggle is set. So each component owns its own thing, and then they're each treated as reusable pieces. And if the state is similar enough, you can simply transition the state with watchers. Here I've built from scratch a chart with view. Just because I'm familiar with SVG, you actually don't need a, a charting library like D3. You can actually just write with v if, v else, and that, those kind of things that view already has in them um, and create a chart. And as the data changes here, the watchers will update and simply transition between them. So I don't even need to be loading a lot of things. It actually owns its own piece of the animation. And I'm not the only one who likes working this way. David Corshi wrote a great um, animated intro to RxJS in which he uses observables to update CSS variables. Because CSS variables, the native kind, um, can be hooked together with JavaScript because they're living and breathing. So it's a really cool article. And goats are cool. I like goats. 
<laughs> and indeed, that's the kind of thinking behind transitioning the state with our little friend Wally here. Wow. Um, basically, what we have here is an at mouse move, that's how we would specify it in view, directly inline, and we have a method called coordinates. And in our methods, we're basically taking a, plot, a timeline that you can make with those Greensock animation APIs, and we're plotting the progress along E client X. So it can actually just stop and pause, but like be plotted along all of those coordinate values. So pretty fun. Um, that's not the only, you know, SVG is super, super awesome, um, but it's really, really good for things that are kind of clean and crisp and not a lot of DOM nodes. If you're going to make a whole world, something like Canvas or WebGL, that's really like a thing where you want to just dance pixels dance all over the place and you don't necessarily need the users to like be digging into the DOM. So SVG is really, really good for UI, UX animation. Um, WebGL and Canvas 3.js is really good for when you're attaching one single node and you want them to just like live in that world and you need them to move around thousands of particles. So they're both really, really awesome and they both have their place. Um, you can actually put SVGs in Canvas. So it's not even an either or. That's something that I've had to clarify a couple of times recently. But Canvas has really, really good support and beautiful performance. This screen grab is like choppity but that, it's not actually choppity. <laughs> I think that's like QuickTime or something. Um, so fictional worlds engage in emotional systems while disengaging action systems. When you're not having to actually move around a website and scroll and navigate the way that you usually do, it kind of like mimics the way that you are like put down when you're dreaming. You're not actually running, you're not actually moving, but that you know, system of imagination is engaged. This is Pottermore Patronus. Um, if you're a Harry Potter fan, it like you can play inside this forest and get like your um, Patronus to kind of follow you around and it assigns a Patronus to you. It's kind of fun. Um, it can also be user interaction driven. So this is all WebGL and it uses SVG. Um, but you know, I was mentioning before those foreshadowing or hints. They have this kind of like cartoonish world, dystopic world, and even the user interactions kind of like complement that. They show you where you're supposed to be going by using cartoon hands, and so you feel comfortable and excited exploring. Um, they kind of have your back when you need it to be shown what to do, but it's also a really, really interesting user experience. I definitely suggest checking it out, um, going to that URL. Um, but definitely with headphones on too, because the music is really good. Here's a great example from Code Drops, where you're choosing seats in a movie theater. So if I say select your seats here, then you actually get a pretty good sense of what it would be like to really be in that theater. Now, if I don't know if you, if I were you, but like. Um, uh, if I had two movie theaters to choose from and one of them offered me to pick my seats this way and the other one was just like, whatever, pick a seat that you don't really understand, I'd definitely pick this site. Um, in order to keep all of these pieces consistent across your site, I think it's really important to have a motion design language. We've heard a lot of people bring up Google material design. That's kind of like the, on the tip of everybody's tongue. Um, but I show this example of like a made up material uh, motion design language. Oh, sorry. I forgot to go to the other thing. Sorry, that's what you should be seeing. <laughs> um, uh, because I think people are confused about material design. A lot of people think that material design is motion design because they've never seen somebody or a brand really have a strong opinion on motion and they did a very good job with it. But people use material design a lot when that's not your company. And I think that's dangerous because every time you work with Google's material design system, people come to your site and they think, Google. Now that's good branding. You just lost a chance to be memorable on your own site. So think about that in terms of the way that you think about fonts or the way that you think about colors on your site. Uh, animation is like just another piece of that, the way that things move. Um, so what does having an opinion on motion design look like in practice? It could mean you've decided to never 
flip things and you're only going to morph things. It could mean that you have a really consistent entrance and exit. It could mean that you have certain developer standards that you live up to. And truly, if you go to this uh, demo later that's live, um, you can see like kind of my musings on each one of these things. So um, people ask me how I would enter motion design into big, you know, kind of companies, and I am asked to do that sometimes. So I think what's really interesting about animation is that each piece of animation in CSS is broken out, and, and JavaScript too, is broken out into interchangeable bits. You have animation timing functions, you have easing structures, you have all of these things that can be written as one line of code, but they can also be interchangeable. So if I have something like, um, you know, H1, H2, H3, H4, and it's understood that H5 is going to be the body text that's like the default for everything, and H1 is going to be for emphasis, for text, we can do the same thing with motion. We can have T1, T2, T3, T4 for timing. And so everybody kind of base works with the timing that's like 0.25 seconds. That's like kind of a good base to work off of. And then if you need to change it or adjust it as you're working with it, it's simply a matter of changing the class. That way you don't need to know everything about animation and you don't have to rewrite it every time and everything stays consistent. The other thing we can do is we can create specific cubic beziers or timing functions or, you know, in JavaScript, sign.easeout or whatever you, what have you, and we can store them as variables and apply them to a class or a variable that's reusable. So you don't need to know a lot about animation to apply an entrance class. So you start with T5, you always have entrance class for entrances, and you have things like entrance emphasis for something that needs to be stronger than everything else. Just like in your color palette, if you have an all green site, you have these green colors, and then you have that one red to kind of really stand out and be an accent. Same kind of idea. So everything can stay really consistent. I'm just using a really, really small example here. We're applying it to an animation. We can update it on the fly and just kind of change a couple of things around and make the animation feel a little bit different. But it still stays consistent across the site. And I show this pop, you know, that's not that sexy or like crazy or wild or whatever, because I think animations in a UI are most useful when they're subtle especially if you have to see them multiple times. People always, like, when I work on these systems, people always have, like, a flip 180 degrees. When do you ever need to flip something 180 degrees? When are you ever going to take a piece of your UI and turn it upside down? Like, I would love to hear that use case, but that's in every single code base I've ever worked on at, like, giant companies. So just thinking about what you really need like, what you really need is probably something way more subtle than that. Um, so we spoke a little bit about how to make, like, re relatable experiences that cause empathy, but it's also a nice if we have a story where the user is a character in that story. So people care about their own story. So in this site, they're kind of showing that everybody has a slavery footprint, no matter where they live and stuff. And so rather than telling you everyone has a slavery footprint, <laughs> What they have you do is go through these kind of exercises and surveys and say whether you're male or female, say where you live, put all in all of these factors, and they make it really playful and beautiful so you're engaged and you actually want to find out your slavery footprint in a way that if somebody just told you that wouldn't be as interesting. And using real-time data can be really powerful for telling stories. So here's a great example from 538, where you can drag different handles and change subjective reality using real-time analytics. Um, but be aware that this kind of forecasting, when done wrong, can have the opposite effect to make people not trust you. So 538 became really addictive for a lot of people during the election, but when the predictions turned out to be false, people were a little bit disenchanted. Um, so real-time data is really powerful this way and can be super addicting, but you have to use it well and trust that the information that you're using is accurate enough. This is an awesome piece of storytelling called Scrolly Telling. It's a device often used by the New York Times. Um, this example is by Shirley Wu. She's a really, really awesome developer, and you should definitely check out her work. She works on a project called Data Sketches with Nadia Brimmer. Um, this experiment was built in D3 and React, and it's a visualization. She saw Hamilton, and she loved 
that musical. So it's a visualization of every single line in Hamilton. And you can see how you can scroll down and the, you know, the story of the site changes. But as the user, you're in total control too. You can stop and play around with things and kind of hover and find more. So it's not like everything is moving all the time. You're kind of still in control. And there's another site called Let's Free Congress, which is also a great example of scrolly telling. It is a good method to hold the user's attention as well as pairing graphics and concepts. So the user's uh, attention is sustained and they also learn while they're on that journey. So more than just showing you one flat graphic, you can see how those like kind of facts and figures change around. I'm like smacking my microphone. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> So what do we learn uh, when we consider our websites to be storytelling? We can think about how they get the user from here to there in the most efficient way, but even if we can't you know, connect those dots so consistently or so easily, like let's say we're on a gi just giant team and it's just moving mountains, we can at least make the journey interesting enough to help them along the way and keep them interested. So in this talk, we went over the most important means to guide a user through a site, that it's just as vital as performance sustained curiosity, thinking about how the users sustain curiosity through storytelling on your site. Um, I have a book about SVG animations. This is not the cover of that book. This is my friend trolling me. I don't have the man blob animal. That's not even my last name. <laughs> This is the cover of my book. Actually, now it's in color, which is really cool. Um, and it just came out two weeks ago. I'm really excited. I spent two years writing it. So for me, it's like a huge release. I have like time on my hands. <laughs> uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about SVG animations, we go through CSS, we go through request animation frame, we go through GreenSock, I go do a comparison study, um, React, all sorts of stuff. Um, so the conclusion here is, the best way to make your site compelling is by actually making it compelling. But wait, is there more? Thank you.